Uh, so yeah, I don't think our paths have ever crossed before, but um, I'm a big fan of the the nine eight bookography. Is that a word? <laughs> uh, Bibliography is it? Is that a word? That's. Uh... I think it would be like I think you could, you could have a bibliography, but I'm not, anyway, whatever. This this is this is not <laughs> this is of no importance to anyone. Um, but I just wanted to talk to you about your book, really, because I'm a I'm a I'm a Kate Bush fan. I I wouldn't say I was a big Kate Bush fan, but that's rather that's rather um, that's not really out of choice, really. And I just thought it was just an interesting premise for a book. So, do you want to tell me where it came about? <laughs> Well, it was suggested to me, actually. I mean, I mean, basically, I'd interviewed Kate in 2005 for Mojo, and she'd been away for 12 years, basically. And this was like her big return interview or whatever. And after that had happened, I mean, it had gone down really well and stuff like that. And then I kind of thought, I'll just leave it at that. And other people had kind of talked to me about writing a book, saying, should do it, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I did sort of think, but there's a lot of time spent in studios, right? And the books that I'd written previously were things that about, say, Paul McCartney in the 1970s, which is a book with a lot of momentum. There's a lot going on. And I'd written a book about Billy McKenzie, the associates, and, you know, the same story. There's a lot of momentum. There's a lot going on. Uh, and so when this was suggested to me late last year, somebody said, look, you should try and do a mosaic. Suddenly it was like, right, okay, right, that would work, right? And I started sort of uh, imagining scenes and chapters and all that sort of stuff straight away. And I also kind of, one of the things that I like to feel, right, before I actually start writing a book, because, I mean, writing a book is a pain in the arse. I mean, it takes a long time and it's, it takes over your life, basically. But I always like to feel, I would read that. And I did feel that with this. And so it was like, right, let's go, let's do it. I have to say, as someone who's writing a book right now, I've got incredibly fond of doing the washing up. <laughs> Procrastination oh, is man. number one tool as a writer, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I've n I never find it with my with my work. Like I do, I've just found with this book, just um, if there's any household chore to do rather than write the book, then I'm I'm right in there. You know, my, my wife. I'm I'm more popular with my wife than I've ever been. I think. <laughs> <laughs> Very tiny, yeah, yeah. No, what I get is an overwhelming sense of fear, actually, at the beginning, right? And also, I look at the books that I've done. I mean, I've only, this is my, what, fourth book, and then I ghost wrote Madness is like early years memoir and stuff. But, you know, this I always just like kind of look at the shelf and I go, how did I do that again? I can't quite remember. And so it's really scary, actually, it's to start off with for me, put it that way. Yeah, you know? <laughs> yeah. I'll let, I'll let, I'll, I've got a couple of months left before my deadline's done, so... Uh... I'll um I'll let I'll let you know in a few months if I if I've broken. I'll just disappear <laughs> I'll just disappear from Twitter and you'll be like, Oh yeah, broken. That's it. With um with Kate though, I mean I guess that like we talk quite a lot as music hacks about almost like the death of mystique. Um, you know, kind of speaking on Twitter and almost like our, our favourite artists live in, in tandem with us. Um I feel like Kate more than anyone has kind of um avoided that. Like do you feel like that's, you know, as someone who's immersed themselves in her music and, and has, has interviewed her, do you feel like that's a conscious choice? Absolutely. I mean, there's a point that I make in the book that uh, most people think that, that Kate has retreated from the normal world, but I think she's retreated to the normal world. And I suppose if there's a one thread running through the book, it's the idea that she never wanted to be famous. Right. She, there's a quote that's on the back of the book, which is, I never wanted to be famous. My desire wasn't to be famous. It was to make a record. That's very different from wanting to be famous. And it's absolutely true. I mean, this is somebody, I think, who wanted to make albums, but didn't particularly want to put themselves out there and sell them. I mean, I mean, she's obviously enjoyed when she stepped on a stage, I think, but she's really enjoyed doing videos, you know, because that's part of the storytelling thing that she does. But I think really, I mean, one of the things that I realised, I didn't realise actually at first that I was doing was I keep on returning to sort of the promo that she does different at different points down the years. And I realised actually that what I was writing was a kind of show don't tell explanation of why somebody would want to get away from this. Because I mean, I devote a whole chapter in the book to her appearing on Multicoloured Swap Shop, but just because it's hilarious, right? All these kids phoning it in and stuff like that. Uh, but then by the time we get to about 1981, 1982 in the Dreamin', right? Dreamin' comes out in 1982. She's having to face like 
really these complete twonks, you know, like Dave Lee Travis and Mike Reeds, who are just painting her as being a nutter. And at a certain point, you must think to yourself, you know what? Nah, I'm not having this, right? And so from that point on, she sort of, she started, all the promo became a bit more targeted, actually, particularly when it got to after sort of the Red Shoes 93 and stuff like that. And from that point on, I mean, she's really carefully chosen what she's done, you know, in terms of public profile. Um, so, yeah, that's where the mystique comes from. Uh, and, yeah, I think she's maintained it more to have a normal life, really, away from the work. Uh, but, I mean, obviously, because of this, I mean, I think people's imaginations fill the gap, don't they? You know, in the absence of Kate herself, you know, the, the people's imaginations sort of decide what they think, in inverted commas, Kate Bush is, you know? Right. So I think that's where the mystique is, really, actually. I think that's where it comes from. I mean, it's not a bad thing for an artist, and I'm sure she appreciates that as well, you know? Um, and I did at one point in one interview that I did in 2006, I said, look, it's, it's fame a pain in the arse. And she said, well, it's double-edged sword, really, isn't it? You know, because it's allowed me to do all these things, but it's made my life a bit difficult in some areas. Such an interesting take on it. I mean, do you think that she is aware of, like, the perception of her? Or do you think she's sort of in blissful denial? No, she's definitely aware of the perception of her, you know, because, I mean, at one point I did say, you know, how do you feel about, you know, fans building up into some, into some sort of goddess? And she says, well, I'm not. I'm a, you know, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Uh, and it's hard, you know, when you're sitting there with somebody in the living room, you know what I mean? It's quite, a, you know, a strange thing about actually be saying to somebody, you know, how do you feel about being perceived as a goddess, you know? So that kind of set the tone for the interview and stuff. I mean, she did say when she was talking about herself and actually when she was talking about fame in general, she was talking about like Elvis and she was talking about like Marilyn Monroe and the people who'd been hugely famous. And she said that I do think that people sense an intention from somebody in terms of what they want to be, what they want to present, you know. And so I think she hopes that people understand what she's trying to put across. And obviously, you know, being called a weirdo on and off down the years has really not helped out at all. Right, right. So I think she's in a great position now, actually, where she can just pop her head up, do the work, you know. Uh, and then pop, you know, disappear again, basically. Nice. Perfect, really, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, do you think there's, um, you know, knowing kind of the machinations of the industry and how it works, do you think that she has people saying, Kate, you need to do more? Or do you think that she holds all the cards? I think there are people who try and persuade her to do things, right? So I think there was a lot of persuading went on after she did the Before the Dawn shows, right? And she'd filmed two of those. And uh, also apparently filmed some bits without an audience present and stuff like that. And I think there was quite a lot of pressure on her to put that out. She decided not to put that out for one reason or another. Uh, and I have heard that, you know, people were sort of... Uh, presenting her with data, right, about why she would do this. But, I mean, she'd also had the same story with her compilation, the whole story, right? So after Hounds of Love comes out in 1985, somebody at the record company comes to her and says, look, you should put out a Greatest Hits album. And she was like, this is a terrible idea, blah, blah, blah. And then they presented her with data, and she decided to do it. And it would, and she said to me, you know, it was my best selling record. It went up to number back up to number one twice and stuff, you know. So she does listen to people, but I think it, she she always says and did say to me that you've got to go on your instinct right. because I mean it was like she, it, it, there was this like lost autobiography uh, that she was supposed to be writing in the early eighties. And I asked her about that, and she said, yeah, I started doing it, and then I just felt, no, it's not right. And and she said, I do want to do things that I feel I want to do and not what other people think I should be doing. Which yeah. is a blood, bloody strong position to be in, really, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, totally. I think that, um, you know, one of, the, one of the ways I feel like music culture has progressed for the better is that uh, female artists have so much more autonomy and perhaps don't, Perhaps it's not so, uh, well, it's just frankly unacceptable really for men to be saying you should 
do this or yeah. you know, maybe you should show a little bit more of that kind of shoulder or what, what have you and i feel like she largely sort of like circumvented that do, do you think that's down to her own vision for what she wanted to be or do you, she, she basically kind of like navig she navigated the 80s where i feel that stuff was really rife very well i think Definitely. And I think really, I mean, she had a rough education, right, the, in the late 70s, because, I mean, obviously she's overnight famous, right? Like, and I mean, I remember I was 11, right, in 1978. So, no, but when Wuthering Heights came out, I must have been 10, right? So I remember watching Top of the Pops every week and she was, I mean, it was such a striking thing anyway. Uh, the video and all the various performances and the record and all this sort of stuff. But she became famous overnight, really a household name. And people were taking the piss out of her voice, like, instantly and stuff. But there's uh, one bit of the book where I go through sort of reviews of a tour of life in 1979, right? And, I mean, some of it is just, you know... And it's like there's one writer sort of going, and now we moved on to the soft, uh, soft focus, soft porn bit of the <laughs> And it's just like, shit, man, you know what I mean? Uh, yeah. I mean, it wasn't that acceptable then. Well, that's the fag end of the 1970s. That's what women had to put up with, I suppose, you know? So by the time it got to the 80s, and obviously the, another theme of the book is her grabbing control inch by inch, right, of, all aspects of her career, right? So she starts producing, well, she starts co-producing the records, doesn't she? And then she starts producing them. She starts directing the videos, you know, so she ends up clawing control of every aspect of her career. And I think from that point on, I mean, there was nobody telling her to do anything. I mean, if she wanted to look sexy, you know, like she did in Babushka, you know, that's a character. But obviously it's about when I pop her, I mean, for especially for a, a teenage boys, you know what I mean? And But that was her completely in control of that, right? There was nobody saying, here, love, stick this on, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it, it, it's in, interesting, isn't it? You know, I mean, she was a pioneer in, in terms of that and really pushing for control, yeah. Yeah, good on you, Kate. Good on you. Yeah. Um, obviously, you've got to be somewhat of a fan to invest um, 90,000 words of your writing career into doing a book. When, when did you come to Kate? Uh, when did your sort of fandom begin? Well, I mean, I, obviously I remember that Wuthering Heights stuff. And I mean, she was, that whole run of, first run of singles, you know, 78, 79. I mean, I admired it, you know, but I didn't buy any of the records. And I was a matter of punk rocker, actually, a kid's punk rocker, really. But then Never Forever was her third album that came out in 1980, and I uh, borrowed it from a record library and taped it, right? So, but the, and the very first record of hers that I bought was Sat in Your Lap, which came out in 1981, and I loved it, right? Because it's just that driving beat, and I mean, it's just, it's completely unique pop record, basically. And and then I bought the Dreaming when it came out, and then 1985, I remember really clearly, right? Because I had a pal who was, let's just say, a small time herbal supplier, right? And he would have loads of people around his house, all sitting, all that cliched shit, sitting around on bean bags and stuff like that. But man, Hounds of Love, right, was on heavy rotation there, you know, because obviously the first side is all the pop charts and stuff like that. And then the second side is just, I mean, it's, it's really dope smoking friendly music, isn't it? You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, from the, from that point, I mean, I, I always had every one of her records, you know, I mean, I never missed a trick really, yeah. I'm always really interested in how, I mean, I, you know, we live in such a connected world now i think it's probably less of the case but you know i was at university in sunland and my introduction to kate was via loads of bands from the area covering kate bush songs and i'm always like what is it about sunderland like what why did sunland go why did these musicians in sunland go for kate bush you know there's that there's that china drum cover of wuthering heights and um, my pals the future heads did uh, hounds of love of which of which she called them and thanked them for um, for projecting her into the charts again, but the, my my friend Ross, the guitarist, he was on the toilet, so he only got a vo he only got a voice message. After it, which I sort of thought it was cooler, really, in a way. You know? Even better, man, right? No, because actually. So I interviewed him in 2005 for that face-to-face -face thing, and I'd been to Glastonbury that year and saw the future heads, like, divide the crowd up. I write about this in the book, right? Because there's a oh, chapter... Right, right. Yeah, I do, man, right? Because there's a chapter about uh, cover versions, right? Good and bad down the years, right? right. 
And yeah, so they uh, divide the crowd up, you know, and get them singing and stuff like that. And I told her about this, you know, and she just loved it, you know. Because also, you've got to remember at the time, nobody knew that she was going to go back on stage again, right? So this was the only chance that you, could, you had to hear Kate Bush songs really loud, you know. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, no, she was massively tickled by that. Yeah, so, but that's great. He was on the ball game, but there's a moment to remember. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, w- w- I mean, it's it's almost a daft question, really, but you can really feel her influence all across pop music right now. Do you, yeah. would, you agree, would you agree with that? Yeah, totally, man. You know, because I mean, one of the things I think that's why "Run Up That Hill" was such a big hit again this year, right? Is if you listen to it, I mean, you can hear aspects of it have dated, but really, like modern pop, right? Which modern pop's not really that arsed about chords, right? So, and neither is running up that hill, really, right? It's so it's all about the beats, right? And all about the vocals and all about the strange sounds, you know? So, there's a lot of strange sounds in modern pop music. And that's why running up that hill really works. And I think that's why it's sort of connected. Also, it's sort of empowering in kind of some vague way. Do you know what I mean? So, it's, you know, kids can sort of take it running up that hill in loads of different ways. You know, it's it's something that can be sort of interpreted in loads of different ways. But yeah, I mean, you hear her influence everywhere. And and also, I mean, I suppose with modern recording and stuff like that, it's much easier in a way to do what was very hard for her to do. I mean, actually, I got an email yesterday from uh, John Leckie, the producer, uh, and he was remembering that he uh, went down to see Kate in Odyssey, Odyssey Studios uh, when she was making the Dreaming. And he said it was real cutting edge stuff, you know what I mean? She had like two tape machines slaved together, which most people don't, didn't do at that time, to give her 48 tracks. And then obviously she's using the Fairlight, which was the sort of Rolls-Royce Pro Tool sampling device, you know? So, I mean, it, it, what she was doing was really pushing at the, the envelope. And now, I mean, w- w- within like Logic or one, one of the other recording programs, I mean, it's, you know, it's a universe of sound and it's much easier to do that. Uh, but that means that you do hear, yeah, I mean, you hear things that she strived to do, other people doing, and it's much easier to do now. Yeah. Do you know what she's uh, cooking up at the moment? Or um, Well, I mean, there's, there's sort of chatter, you would say, right, on the, on the fan groups and stuff like that, because Del Palmer, who is her... You know, he was a boyfriend for 15 years and then when they split up, stayed on as a recording engineer. But he was quite active and lively on Facebook and stuff like that. And then he went quiet about a year ago. And I keep on hearing that she's very busy, right? So I would imagine, I mean, it's been 11, yeah, well, I mean, there was a 12-year gap in between the Red Shoes and Ariel. And we're now coming on to that again since our last album in 2011, 50 Words for Snow. Now, obviously, there was the Before the Dawn shows, you know what I mean, which took two years out of her life to do and stuff like that. But, yeah, I mean, I would imagine... I would imagine there's someone coming next year. Hopefully, eh? Exciting. I feel like we sort of turned into a sort of investigative true crime podcast for a moment. Exactly. There. That's what we should do, mate. Yeah, That's good. a good That's idea, good. yeah. <laughs> so the book's out right now. Yes. And I, that will be in the shops. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So tenor on Amazon as well. Fill your boots. <laughs> amazing amazing i know yeah well listen tom thanks so much man um everyone should go buy your book and uh and celebrate the genius of kate bush brilliant cheers james it's ace thanks. <laughs>